The Old Testament lesson appointed for this Transfiguration Sunday is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, the 34th and last chapter of the book. We pick up at the first verse. But before we do that, you're going to hear, hear it begin in kind of a weird way. It says, and then Moses went up. Well, uh, see, we got to look at chapter 33 first. Uh, Moses had just finished blessing Israel. Basically, Moses is, uh, this is his swan song. Uh, he's giving Israel the final blessing, reminding them of how they are blessed in the Lord, and they're getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And Moses cannot cross over into the promised land. There's a consequence for his action. If you remember way back, God told him to speak to the rock and it will give the Israelites water. But Moses, in his anger, uh, well, he let his temper get the better of him, better of him, and he struck the rock. Now, God still provided water for the Israelites, but Moses had disobeyed God, and so there's a consequence. Moses could not enter into the promised land with the people. That's actually what Deutero, Deuteronomy means. Deutero uh, means second. Nomos means law or word. So this is the second giving of the word before Moses uh, dies and Israel. Basically, what Moses is saying is, you know, you are blessed children. Next time I see you, we'll be in heaven. Now, bear in mind, this is Transfiguration Sunday, so you're going to, I'm already tipping the hand. You're going to hear in the gospel lesson that Moses is in the promised land. He's with Elijah, and he's speaking with Jesus about Christ's impending exodus, his salvation exodus. So uh, Moses does get to go to heaven. He does go to the promised land. It's just in this earthly life, there was a consequence for his action. So with that, let's hear this, okay? Then, after blessing Israel, then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pishka, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead, as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the lands of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negeb, the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zoar. And the Lord said to him, This is the land of which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to your offspring. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him, God buried him, in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the place of his burial to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed, his vigor unabated. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the people of Israel obeyed him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. This is the word of your Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is the letter to the Christian Hebrews. It's the third chapter. Again, we pick up at the first verse, and you'll hear the language of therefore, holy brothers. Well, uh, therefore what? What was the preceding text? If you read in chapter 2, it's all about Jesus. Everything. The author is laying out how we are brothers of Jesus, how Jesus shares in our flesh, how he suffered and was tempted for us, and how he overcame that temptation for us. God doesn't share the same flesh as angels, but he does. You know, it, it's us. It's for all of our sake that Christ did everything he did. So, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. 
This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke. Pick up at the ninth chapter, the 28th verse. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. This is the gospel of your Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Epiphany is all about how God manifests himself to his people, how he makes himself known. We've heard this for the past seven weeks, and we see it in spades in this morning's gospel lesson. In fact, we get a four-for-one epiphany today, don't we? I mean, it's plain as day how Christ reveals his divinity as he's transfigured before the eyes of Peter, James, and John. But God the Father also gets in on the action, right? God the Father also manifests himself by speaking. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And don't forget the fact that Moses and Elijah, representatives of the entire Old Testament people of faith, they too are, uh, they, they are revealed to the three disciples as they talk with Jesus about his upcoming exodus. Now think on that. Moses and Elijah were discussing and revealing God's impending plan of salvation with the very one who was about to bring that plan to completion. In fact, they were speaking with that plan made flesh. Here atop this mountain, Almighty God is essentially pulling out all the stops and pulling back the veil, revealing to his disciples in no uncertain terms who this Jesus really and truly is. He is the Almighty God. He is their Lord and Savior in the flesh. Now, keep in mind that it was only a mere eight days before this miraculous transfiguration that St. Peter had actually rebuked Jesus when Jesus began to tell them of the necessity of his journey to Jerusalem and how it was necessary that he suffer and be killed and on that third day rise again. I mean, this was the very exodus plan of salvation that Jesus and Moses and Elijah were talking about at the transfiguration. Jesus is saying, yeah, this is all necessary. Again, think on that. Jesus was already revealing to them in no uncertain terms. Eight days earlier, he was revealing to them how the whole plan of salvation was going to play out. And how does Peter respond? He said, well, not on my watch, Jesus. This will never happen as long as I have something to say about it. (laughs) Can you imagine? Peter believes that Jesus is his God and Lord. You know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, which he confessed only a few days before. And yet he was now hell-bent on making sure that the Lord didn't do the very thing he was sent to do. And yeah, I, I do say this term very purposefully, right? Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So yeah, Peter was truly hell-bent on saving Jesus. And, you know, it all makes sense now doesn't perfect sense i mean the clarity of 2020 hindsight's like that see from our vantage point looking back from our vantage point on this side of the cross we understand that this is precisely why god was pulling back the veil on the divinity of christ on that mountaintop god wanted these men to see and to know before all the terrors of christ's suffering and death would commence he wanted them to see and to know that jesus not only has god's favor that he was, in fact, fully God. And as Almighty God in the flesh, all that was about to go down in the days and weeks to come, that was all part of God's good and gracious will. 
See, it's all a very necessary part of his plan for salvation. And we confess that, don't we? God works all things for the good of those who love him, right? Well, God is showing these yahoos in this transfiguration. He's showing them that even though everything in their lives is about, you know, is about to look like it, like it's come undone and gone off the rails, he's showing them, look, still in control, absolute control. God showing him that he knows what he's doing, and this is all part of his good and gracious will. It's all part of his plan, the plan for their salvation. That's why he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And yet we, we know how this plays out, don't we? The disciples see with their own eyes this miraculous display of divine power and glory and life. They hear with their own ears how all of this, the cross, pointing to the cross, they hear how all of this was all part of the Exodus plan from the get-go, right? That planned Exodus from bondage to freedom, from death to life. They hear it. They see it. And yet they aren't gathered around that Good Friday cross praising God for their salvation, are they? You know, as Christ is is taking part in that exodus, you know, sacrificing himself for their sin, being lifted up, put on full... No, they're not there praising God for that. Quite the opposite. They're in hiding. See, they've seen all they needed to see, and they're terrified. Life's not going according to their plan, so they hit the ejection seat. I mean, even as these horrific events, which were all necessary parts of God's plan of salvation, even as they were beginning to play out, like Monday, Thursday, the great St. Peter tried not once but three times to save his own hide. He denied that he even knew Jesus. Now, of course, we don't even have to look that far out, you know, to, to Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We don't have to look that far out to see how the disciples were already failing in their command to listen to Jesus. I mean, right here on this Transfiguration Mount, St. Peter is still shaking out the cobwebs when he's telling Jesus that he and, his, you know, he and the boys will start constructing three tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, you know, so that they can stay put and, and start setting up shop for the revolution to begin. If Peter is bumping his gums. That's when uh, the Heavenly Father, in his mercy, interrupts Peter. In the midst of his foolishness, God interrupts. He says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Sadly, Peter's too busy talking, right? He's dictating his plans for God. He's too busy talking to actually listen to what Jesus has said and will say. Now, like I said a few moments ago, we're standing on this side of the cross, right? We know the rest of the story. We know and we understand the absolute necessity of Christ's suffering and death. Knowing what we know, we, we'd have no problem in telling Peter to just shut up. But you know what? Not so fast. I mean, are we really any different? God is always working all things for the good of those who love him, right? <laughs> it's easy to say. In fact, I'd say it's easy to believe, you know, when things are going well. But it's not so easy to believe when things aren't exactly going to plan, is it? Our plan. In fact, it's very difficult to believe that God is working in or through our suffering for our good or for the good of those who love him. I mean, suffering rears its ugly head in our lives, and the first words out of our mouth, uh, it's not praise, but cries of woe. You know, why God? Why this? Why now? Why me? As if God is... You know, somehow made a mistake. He must have made a mistake, right? I mean, why else would we be suffering? Guys, look around at this dark and shadowy veil of tears that we call home. Wars and rumors of wars and plagues and civil unrest, you know, all the stuff described in Scripture. I mean, that's just this past week. What about the last couple of years? I mean, who here has praised God for the good of COVID? And for uh, praised God for all the attendant madness that's born out of COVID. You praised God for any of that? You know, let, what about the personal crosses you're bearing? You know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, not, not quite. See, before you go all full pity party, I want you to look around. Look at all that God has so graciously revealed to you regarding his love for you regarding his very real Emmanuel presence with you. 
Look at that baptismal font. Look at the altar, the pulpit, the lectern, the communion rail. Guys, here is your Lord, the same Lord Christ who stood atop that mountain in all his transfigured glory. And he's not here in wrath to strike you down or punish you, is he? He's here with you and for you in love. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Now, from this vantage point, do we behold the full glory of God? <laughs> no, and that's where the problems arise, right? We don't see Christ. We look and we, we only see the veil, don't we? We see ordinary elements. We see ordinary men speaking and administering these ordinary elements in rather ordinary and unspectacular ways. Now, let's face it, the heavens aren't rending. There's no heavenly cloud. There's no booming voice from heaven or radiated glory. None of that. But be honest, would we really want all of that? I mean, after all, it's much easier to keep doing what we want to do when this veil's up. It's a whole lot easier to justify our sin against God when it's not so obvious that our Lord is right here with us and for us. I mean, we, we would never blow off Jesus, would we? But it's not so difficult to blow off church, is it? We would never blow off Jesus, but it's not so difficult to blow off his rather plain and ordinary-looking means of grace. But you know what? Rather than continue down this road, let's do something radical. <laughs> Tongue-in-cheek radical. You know, our Heavenly Father's command rings just as true for us today as it did for those men on that mountaintop so long ago. Listen to him. It's a humble thing. It's a humble thing that certainly doesn't come natural to us children of Adam. I know this. We'd much rather prefer to blame God for our woes and sorrows. We'd much rather prefer to tell God how to do his job. God says, no, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Stop telling. Listen. By God's grace, through the working of his Holy Spirit, we're able to do just that. I mean, look to the necessary cross of your Lord and Savior. Look and listen to what he declares from this Calvary mountaintop. He says it's finished, and it is finished, right? Listen to him, for it is this mountaintop victory that he brings to us in, with, and under these veiled elements of word, water, bread, and wine. Listen to his holy word. Listen to what he says, right? Paul, Paul talks about, he says, Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized are baptized in his death and resurrection? Christ's victory is our victory, that, that cruciform side-pierced victory that he brings to us, that he bestows upon us through the washing of water and word. I mean, even in the midst of all the sorrow and despair and anxiety and sickness and anger and fear, uh, even as the drums of war seem to bang louder and faster every passing day, guys, we're already the victors. Even as all that goes on and comes undone, we're already the victors. Don't trust your eyes. Trust your ears. Listen to him. Look at this altar, right? Take and eat. Take and drink. This is my body. This is my blood for the forgiveness of all your sin. As often as you do this, remember what I have said. Then after communion, what do we hear? Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Listen to him. For it is through the listening of faith that the Holy Spirit opens our eyes of faith so that we can see and recognize and hold fast to our Lord and Savior who's in our very midst. You know, our very loving and gracious Emmanuel, God with us. It's through the gracious working of the Holy Spirit in faith that we're able to recognize our Lord's face shining upon us in mercy and grace and love and peace. Folks, here's Christ. Listen to him. Listen to him, for he says and does all these things simply because he loves you. He's promised to never leave you nor forsake you. He's promised to abide with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, here he is, just like he promises, and he's doing exactly what he promises to do. In fact, like he says, he's working all things for your good and for the good of all those who love him. Look to this cross. Here's the proof, right? 
may this very real and very present Emmanuel made manifest in your very hearing, recognized and apprehended through the God-given gift that is faith. May he be your joy, your peace, your blessed assurance in both good times and in bad times, in sickness, in health, rich or poor, better, worse, and everything in between, now and in all eternity. Amen.